Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's virtual wine event, Taste New York, Meet the Makers with Melissa Stunden. My name is Sam Filler and I'm the executive director of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. We are the organization representing the talented and hardworking winemakers and grape brewers across New York State. And we have the privilege of bringing you this evening's tasting. As your neighbor to the Southeast, the New York wine region may just be the closest in growing conditions to Ontario's own Niagara region. We share similar soil types, varietal typicity, and geographical location. While the circumstances in the world are what they are, I'm here in New York City and we're looking at a lockdown soon too. So even though we're physically apart, we're, we're pleased that we can get together tonight virtually uh, with you, our friends, our neighbors, to share our love for cool climate wines. We truly hope that you enjoy the six different wines selected for you from two of New York's major growing regions. From the Finger Lakes to Long Island, you'll be delighted as you experience the differences and similarities between them and hear the stories directly from the minds behind the wines that have recently made their way north as part of uh, online exclusives and vintages at the LCBO. And now for a bit of housekeeping, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You're invited to submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen at any time. Using this feature ensures that Melissa and our panel of winemakers can see the question. We also encourage you to start a discussion with other participants, and you can do this by using the chat feature and selecting all attendees. Talk about what you taste, share your notes with the other New York wine enthusiasts, and give us your feedback on the wines. To, to familiarize yourself with tonight's wines, We've prepared a tasting map, text sheets, and a map of our regions. If you've not had a chance to review those yet, we encourage you to click on the link we've just provided in the chat to be taken to those resources. One last note, after tonight's event, we will provide you with a recording to listen at your le leisure or share with friends. We also provide you with information on how you can get more New York wines should you find a favorite or two tonight. And with that, I'd like to welcome our host, Melissa Stunden. Melissa was part of the Canadian Association of Professional Sommeliers, uh, CAP's first graduating class in 2016, where she achieved her sommelier certification, certificate with academic honors. Following her certification, she worked as an assistant sommelier to Jennifer Huther, who's also an MS at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, where she achieved the prestigious award of top 30 under 30. After six incredible years with the team at Maple Leaf Sports, Melissa decided to pursue a career in wine sales. And in 2017, Melissa started her own beverage alcohol consulting company after winning the contract to manage the market development of the New Zealand wine category all across Canada. Melissa works very closely with the trade, media, liquor boards, and educational bodies to host a series of different events over the course of the year to help support all things New Zealand wine, and now New York wines as well. So we're pleased to have her with us today. And with that, we'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Sam. Welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here tonight. Uh, what a great way to start off the holiday season. I wore my holiday shirt for you all and put up my Christmas tree. Um, like I said, I'm so happy to be here. I wish we could be tasting wines together. Unfortunately, with the COVID situation, Hey, we're embracing uh, the new normal, or like I like to say, the next best thing, tasting wine from our homes. For those of you who I haven't met, I grew up in the Niagara wine region, um, neighbors to the New York State wine region, and I couldn't help when I started to work with New York, draw so many parallels between the two regions, specifically the Finger Lakes and the Ontario or Niagara wine regions. Um, whether that was the similarities between the viticulture practices or the cool climate viticulture practices, the varietal selection, the soils, or just the industry as a whole. And I think that's really going to come through as we taste the wines and we meet the winemakers from this area. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panelists of winemakers. So I'm just going to ask as I'm say your name, if you wouldn't mind just giving a wave so everyone could familiarize themselves with you. I'm going to be reading off the names um, in the order of tasting. So I'm going to start with John Wagner of Wagner Vineyards. Uh, John comes to us from Seneca Lake in the Finger Lakes. And we'll follow that with Julia Hoyle from Hosmer Winery. And she comes over to us from Cayuga Lake. 
And then we'll move over to Dave Breeden of Sheldrake Point in Cayuga Lake as well. And then following that, we will have a visit with Christopher James Tracy. So we'll go down to Long Island. So we'll move south from there. And then over to Megan Frank of Dr. Constantine Frank Winery, which will be back up into the Finger Lakes. And we'll be headed over to Cayuga Lake, which is not to be confused with Cayuga Lake, but we'll get into that as we go. And last but not least, we'll have a chat with Bruce Murray of Boundary Breaks, um, and we'll head back to Seneca Lake. So I just wanted to give a few stats that I found on the New York State wine region. I thought they were really interesting, and I think it helps just to give a bit of context into the region that we're going to be exploring today. So New York State is the third largest wine growing region outside of California and Washington State, and is home to 471 wineries. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Ontario wine ind industry, just to give you some context, Ontario has about 185, so you can see the significant difference in size there. It's also home to America's oldest continuously operating winery called Brotherhood Winery, which is located in the Hudson Valley, which has been making wine for almost 175 years. So that is a long time considering um, such a new world winemaking country. Um, the region itself is comprised of a, sorry, 11 AVAs. So those of you who are not familiar with AVA, that refers to American Viticulture Area. So the areas in which the wineries are located, two of which we'll be speaking about this evening. So we'll be talking um, a lot about the Finger Lakes and we'll also be visiting Channing Daughters on Long Island. There's approximately 35,000 acres planted to vine. And just again, to give you a comparison to the Ontario wine industry, uh, we have about 17,000 acres planted to vine. So almost double um, to Ontario. And then just a really interesting stat, I thought um, the industry's overall economic impact is approximately $6.65 billion. And that is the direct impact generated by the wine and grape industries of New York. So not a small contribution to uh, the bottom line. So if we can move to the next slide, um, we're gonna show the maps here. I just had a few reminders before we get started in terms of the tasting component. Um, I know everyone's excited to get going, but just a few things to notice. So for those of you who have one glass, no problem to taste throughout the whole series with the one glass, we'll be tasting lighter to fuller body. So you don't have to worry about um, changing glasses if you only have the one. Um, the wines are, are listed in order on the capsules from one through six, and we'll be tasting in that order. And the tasting map that was provided in your kits um, we'll be tasting starting on the left hand side with the Wagner Vineyards Dry Riesling and we'll be moving clockwise over to uh, Boundary Breaks. We also encourage you to start tasting the wines as we start speaking with the winemakers because we do only have an hour and we have six amazing panelists and six different wines to try so please start tasting as we go along. And we encourage you to ask questions. So as Sam mentioned, please, um, in the chat, please start asking questions as well as the Q&A that will direct us, um, sorry, the Q&A will direct us to answer those questions and the chats will be amongst yourselves. So without further ado, let's get started. We will begin with Wagner Vineyards and John. So John, you have a long history in the area. Your family have been growing grapes in the Finger Lakes for over five generations specifically in Seneca Lake. It is my understanding that when the region was formed, um, the glaciers actually receded and pulled with it the soil, creating these craters or breaks in the landscape, which is actually what identifies uh, the Finger Lakes that we see today. Would you mind taking us through the map quickly that you've provided, which I think is super interesting, to go through sort of the major lakes we're gonna be talking about today, specifically Seneca Lake, and then touching a little bit about your winery, Wagner Vineyard. Absolutely. So uh, this is playing off the, the map that you showed in the ABA slide. Uh, this is a slide that was taken April 1st in 2015 from space that shows the Finger Lakes uh, at a very cold uh, time during the winter. And you can see actually the, the 11 uh, Finger Lakes that are, uh, are frozen over. So they're shown in white where they have ice on them, except for the full extent of Seneca Lake is open water and the majority of Cuga Lake is open water. And 
this effect, these deep glacial uh, created lakes, um, the fact that they contain so much water and they are so deep, um, like Seneca Lake hasn't frozen over since 1912. Um, if, if you take all the volume of the entire 11 Finger Lakes, half of that volume is Seneca Lake. So that open water uh, does a lot for us throughout the year. Um, probably its main benefit is wintertime temperature moderation. So our winery is located right here where this W is on the east side of Seneca Lake. And we get a prevailing northwest wind uh, coming across this deepest part of the lake here. It's 640 feet deep at its deepest point, which is coincidentally right in front of the farm. Um, and that moderates the temperature uh, along the east side of, of Seneca Lake. And the other Finger Lakes to get the, uh, similar effects. Um, you can get it on the smaller Finger Lakes um, up until the point when they do get ice cover. Um, if, if you do get ice cover on the lake, uh, you, you lose that effect uh, where the, the open water can give up its heat. So we have a long history, as you spoke of, Melissa, here on the east side of Seneca Lake. Uh, my family has grown grapes here for five generations. Um, that part of it goes way back. Um, my father was Bill Wagner, and he was a lifelong grape grower for one of the large wineries in the area, the Taylor Wine Company. And he uh, had delivered grapes to them, uh, grown grapes for many decades, and really seen that massive winery, large scale production, and really thought of it, you were either a, a grape grower or you were a commercial winery, but there was no mixing really of the two. And he and my mother took a, took a trip to Europe in 72 um, with some other grape growers from the Finger Lakes. And it was really the first time that he saw winemaking on a small scale. Uh, he saw small vineyards producing wine in their barn behind their house, in their garage. Um, and it, was, it really hatched the idea to him that he could do it uh, when he got back here. So kind of unbeknownst to the rest of the family, he, be, he began to plan our winery uh, when he returned in 72. Um, and he was a, if, if you knew my dad, Bill Wagner, he was definitely a, a, a big project guy. He, he was always looking for the next challenge. And uh, he had this thing planned in his mind. And in 1976, New York State passed the Farm Winery Act, which allowed growers the ability to go into the wine business. Um, they kind of lowered the bar financially for what the license cost. And the big change was that we could sell uh, retail as well as wholesale. So it opened up the possibilities of having a tasting room, um, bringing uh, visitors in, tasting through the wine. So um, we began construction in 76 and we built the building ourselves. It is the unique octagonal building still shown on our, on our label. Um, and we opened in June of 79. And in the, in the early days, we were producing uh, wines from the grapes that we had planted in the ground for the Taylor Wine Company. Um, so those were mo mostly French American hybrids. Um, but in, in 78, my dad realized the potential for European varieties and vinifera grapes, and he, he planted Riesling. Riesling was the first vinifera that we planted. Uh, we still farm that same vineyard. It's 42 years old now. Um, and soon to follow was Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, um, and then the Pinot Noir and the Bordeaux Reds uh, in, the, in the early 80s. So in the first 15 years or so of the winery, we had those vinifera varieties planted in uh, roughly equal proportions. And we really saw the, how Riesling could shine through. It was really um, producing excellent wines in every vintage whether it be dry and hot, uh, like it was this year, or whether we had a cool wet season. Whereas some of the other, the Bordeaux Reds that required uh, a lot more growing degree days, um, we really had to work in some of those more challenging years. So uh, 25 years ago, we really decided to expand uh, our Riesling plantings. Uh, we have steadily grown our acreage. Uh, we are 100% estate bottled. So we have 225 acres of grapes all here on the east side of Seneca Lake. 
Um, and uh, a little over a quarter of that, 62 acres, is devoted to Riesling. So we have Riesling that's, uh, as I spoke of, that old our original heritage block is 42 years old. Um, we, have, we have blocks that are uh, younger, six years old as our youngest block. We have multiple blocks, um, 750 feet above sea level. We have uh, our Kwood East blocks as high as 1,000 feet above sea level. So we've really got, we got a lot of different uh, Riesling plantings, a lot of different age vines, and uh, we're, we're fortunate to have a pretty advantageous site here on the east side of Seneca Lake. We have honey oil silt loam soil, um, very well-drained, uh, deep soils. We have that effect of Seneca Lake uh, that moderates our, our ultimate winter low temperature. It also, uh, during harvest season, we get, uh, as soon as the sun goes down below the horizon, uh, cools, the, cools the temperature off. And that's really key on Riesling as well because it preserves the acidity. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that we can shine in producing Riesling and you don't see a lot of Riesling coming out of California because uh, they, they lose that acidity pretty quickly with the heat that they have at night. So uh, as we have uh, really expanded this Riesling acreage and, uh, and got a lot more vineyards and clones to work with, um, it's, it's really showed in our Riesling program. Um, the, the, like I said, the first 15 years we had the winery, all of our Riesling came off of one block. Uh, so very similar taste profiles between our dry and our semi-dry and our Riesling Select. But um, as, as we've expanded those acreages, we've really been able to, uh, to, to really distinguish between all those, those wines. Um, so tonight we're gonna be tasting our 17 dry. Uh, 17, uh, pretty unique growing season. They all, they all seem to be challenging. I'm, I'm waiting for the easy one. Uh, 2020 was a, was not bad. We we had uh, other than the the global pandemic, uh, we we had a lot of growing degree days. We had a lot of heat, dry, uh, pretty pretty leisurely harvest. 17, we had a wet year, uh, so quite a bit of rain throughout the growing season. Um, most vineyards were carrying uh, average to a slightly above average crop size. And about August, we really started to get a little nervous that uh, were we going to be able to get this crop right? Um, and we were, we were fortunate enough to have just an awesome September and October, above average temperatures, a lot of sun, and we really were able to get stuff super ripe. And that's really the hallmark of of our vineyard and our estate bottled wines. Um, that history of grape growing goes way back. That is our forte. We, we hang fruit a long time in the vineyard. Um, and we really think that by getting super ripe fruit, that's where the flavor is created. Um, and we bring it in the winery. One of the things uh, we, we mechanically harvest most of our Riesling and we think by doing that, we can, we can hang it a little longer and we also can harvest it at the peak of ripeness and at the temperature that we really want to bring it in at. So uh, we do a lot of night harvesting with that. Um, it is a state-of-the-art harvester, which actually destems the fruit right in the vineyard. Uh, we return the, the stems to the soil to be composted. So a lot, a lot goes into this Riesling program. Um, this, this 17 dry, um, is comprised of two clones, clone 90 and clone 198. Um, it did receive 90 points from the wine enthusiast. Um, it was entered into the 2019 Wine Classic in New York State and was judged best Riesling, best dry Riesling, and best white wine in the state for that competition. Uh, so that was one of the wines that uh, garnered us uh, the winery of the year for 2019. So we're extremely proud of this Riesling. Um, it, it is dry. It has the IRF scale on the back label. Um, so if you guys can, can turn your bottle to around to see that IRF scale, uh, you'll see the pointer down there at dry. This is one of the things we've done for uh, probably about six or eight years now. So any bottle of Riesling that we produce um, you're able to 
reference that IRS scale and really get an idea of, of what you're buying. Uh, that's one of, one of the things that we fight with Riesling a lot of the time. People say all Rieslings are sweet and they absolutely are not all sweet. And we make several, uh, our Kwood East single vineyard is a bone dry Riesling. This, this dry is extremely dry as well. Um, Thank so you, Jeff. I think, I think we, may, we might have to move, keep moving on to the tasting, but I had one last question for you. Now you have, yep. you have a cafe on site named after your sister, I believe. It, it's named after my niece, actually, niece? my, my okay. sister's daughter. Your sister's daughter. Yeah. And I'm assuming they serve this Riesling there. What would you suggest as a food pairing to go with this Riesling? So I, I drink a lot of dry Riesling with, with fish. We, my wife and I eat a lot of salmon, any kind of seafood, light salads. It just, the acidity in here um, pairs very well and cuts through some of those flavors. It's, a, it's my go-to food wine for any, uh, any seafood or fish. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we're going to be moving on if we could go to the next slide. So we're actually going to take a step back and go back to the Wagner Vineyard slide just to take a look at those uh, lakes again. Um, Julia, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about these lakes. Um, the Hoffer family were also pioneers in the industry and starting the winery over 40 years ago. So I'm sure they have quite a bit of um, involvement in the evolution of the industry around this lake. Um, would you mind touching a little bit about um, this lake and just maybe identifying some of the differences between and then perhaps we could talk a little bit about Hosmer Winery itself. Yeah, um, so the Hosmers started growing grapes about 50 years ago. Um, and for Keys Lake, were some of the earlier growers of vinifera. Uh, the Chardonnay that you have, that's from a block also planted in 1978. So just like John's Riesling. Um, and I think Keys Lake, especially the side that both Hosmer and Sheldrake Point are on, um, we always joke that our fruit comes in pretty late. Um, we seem to be about one full, we measure sugar and bricks, maybe a full bricks behind other regions on Seneca Lake, which gives us the ability to just hang the fruit until late October, early November. We'll still have good acidity and we're not going to have crazy high bricks. Um, so we have really great flavor development. Um, and that seems to be a hallmark. Um, Cuba Lake is also deep, not as deep as Seneca, um, as you can see by the map. Only the very top really freezes. That's pretty marshy and shallow. Um, and historically, the west side was more built up um, and more and more there are newer wineries on the east side. Okay, interesting. So then let's dive in a little bit about varieties because obviously Riesling, which we just spoke to John about, um, being one of the larger plantings in the Finger Lake specifically, um, we're tasting a Chardonnay. Now, uh, Chardonnay is one of those varietals like Riesling. I think people sometimes are a little bit um, hesitant because they don't necessarily know the style that they're going to be getting unless they know the winery and then they know the area. Um, and uh, obviously coming from a cool climate area, you'd expect something really fresh and vibrant, but I think this is also your sort of winemaking style. So could you talk to us a little bit about um, the Chardonnay and sort of your, your viticulture practices um, and, and just are, are we seeing a lot of um, oak aging, malolactic fermentations, stuff like that? Yep, no, for sure. So Chardonnay, when we actually first were chatting um, the other day, you asked, you know, a question, why Chardonnay on the property? And I never thought to ask Cameron Hosmer that question. And I asked him, he said, well, everyone likes Chardonnay. I was <laughs> like, well, that, that's a fair answer. You know, back in the 70s, when you're trying to figure out what to plant, Chardonnay was a good go-to. People knew it, um, and it was going to be an easier sell. Um, now that block of fruit, which is in the bottle, um, is still trained, it's called Umbrella. Um, so sort of high cordon, um, you can have a slightly, I mean, it's all about balance, but you can have a heavier crop set um, as well as really great ripening and retaining acidity. Um, and that acid component is really important to the Chardonnay. Um, I, you know, our house style is that bright, crisp, a small component, about 10% does go through neutral barrel, starts malolactic fermentation, it doesn't complete. And for the style, I'm okay with that. 
Um, I want a little bit of creaminess, not a lot. I want the crisp sort of linear side of it to come through. A um, little bit of leaves work as well, just to kind of round it out, but I'm not looking for a lot of oak influence. Are we seeing a lot of Chardonnay being produced in the Finger Lakes? Are we seeing more and more? Is this a great variety that people are gravitating to in terms of winemaking styles or are, are could you maybe add some, some information yeah, to that? For sure. Yeah, so Chardonnay, I think a lot of people have been growing for a while in the Finger Lakes and stylistically a lot of it was more the, like a stainless steel, less oak. And there's that peak where everyone wanted really oak Chardonnay. Um, and you know, followed a trend, but in recent years you're seeing sales and you just go, I need to make 10 <laughs> times more of this crisp version of Chardonnay. And there's a market for an oak Chardonnay that's there. So you want to have that product. Um, but I think for a long time, 30, 40 years, people have been growing Chardonnay and experimenting with it. And it's a growing category. It also has the possibility of growing sparkling production as well. So we are poised climate wise to be really great for sparkling wine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I love this style too, because I think it really sort of lends to food pairings, but also it's one of those styles that you can have more than one glass. I find yeah. if it's too heavily out, you end up with, you, you have one glass um, and when you're fatigued or you move on to something else. So really enjoying the style that you're producing. So thank you for sharing that yeah. with us. So we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, I just love maps and I really enjoyed looking through this one. Um, just the, the organization of the planting and the different varietals um, I think is really interesting. Dave, you've obviously done a lot of work to sort of identify those areas that are best planted um, for those individual Vitis vinifera varietals. So having joined the winery as a winemaker in 2002, you have, and with two chemistry degrees and two philosophy degrees, um, you have the background and the experience to really understand those pieces of land. Would you mind kind of walking us through this, um, this map and talking to us a little bit about the varieties that you're planting? Sure. Um, so a lot of that, I, as much as I would like to be able to take credit for it, it was here when I got here. So anything before 2002, was the original plantings. And I don't really know how much they knew, but they were really good at guessing. And they put good grapes in the right places. I mean, obviously they knew Pinot Noir wanted to be closer to the lake because it's not as cold hardy. Riesling and Cab Franc could be further away from the lake because they are considerably more cold hardy. And by and large, we've been really happy with what's been planted and where. Um, that block of Riesling 07 you see down at the bottom, that, you know, that why was, why did we wait until 07 to plant that? Um, we waited until 07 to plant that because prior to that it was Merlot. Merlot is not as cold hardy as you might like, and even being right there fairly close to the lake, it died a horrible death on a cold, cold winter. And so we ripped it out and put in Riesling, which has survived quite happily there. Is that what you had in mind? Absolutely, no. And so... If we talk a little bit more about varietals, um, Cabernet Franc obviously um, is a variety that we typically expect uh, when we're talking about red, um, but you have been producing a flagship rosé since 2007, correct? And it is 100% Cabernet Franc? We've been making dry rosé actually since 1997. So oh, 97, my apologies. 10 years prior to that. It was not always 100% Cabernet Franc. We figured out that it should be Cabernet Franc around 2010, 2011. We had used Merlot, we had used Pinot Noir, we had used various and sundry things that we had. But really the Cab Franc is, is a grape that's incredibly well suited for our region. Um, even with vintage variation and part of being in a cool climate, as I'm sure you all know up in, in Niagara, it's Cool climate means vintage, a lot of vintage variation. We can go from hot to cold to wet to dry. And every single year we're able to produce a dry rosé that I'm really proud of from Cabernet Franc. We have to change how we handle it. We have to change the days we pick it or the, the date that we pick it. But we can always make a really, really good dry rosé. Okay. And that's sort of your, is that one of the grapes that you prefer to work with typically? Or you're... 
you're not really preferential to any one grape, but that's one that you think is best suited for this rosé. It's definitely best suited for this rosé. It's also really well suited for red wine. We'll have a, a red wine made from Cabernet Franc later in the tasting that I, I quite like. Um, so it's, it's well suited for the Finger Lakes, and that's great. There are other, you know, obviously one can't talk about grape growing in the Finger Lakes without talking about Riesling. Riesling is the predominant grape in the Finger Lakes, and we do it really, really well. So one, one doesn't like to choose among, amongst one's, you know, children, as it were, <laughs> or you know, who like Gewurztraminer. You can't neglect Gewurztraminer or Pinot Gris. There's so many good wines that can be made. But well, you, this one you have, we can make a lot of. You have a lot of children from that uh, vineyard map, so I'm sure it would be difficult right. to pick. Um, one other question I had for you in terms of your sustainability program. Um, I noticed you're using a lot of geothermal and solar energy in the winery. Could you touch on that just a little bit? Sure. So the second year I moved to Sheldrake, or the year after I moved to Sheldrake, they um, converted to uh, solar electricity for the winery building and the buildings near it. It didn't provide electricity for the whole campus, but it did for the production area. And then two years ago, when we built a new winery, when we finally outgrew the other one, the decision was made to heat it with geothermal heat sources rather than fossil fuel heat sources, essentially. So the, we, we heat and cool the building with water out of the ground that comes out of the ground around the temperature we want to be. So we don't have to change that temperature very much to get the building to where we want. Okay, interesting. Um, can we go back to the rosé for a few minutes and just talk about um, in terms of style and tasting profile. Um, so being 100% Cabernet Franc, it's still, it's fairly light in color. Like, would you compare this to another style of rosé or um, is this sort of the classic? Uh, so for Sheldrake, this is really, really dark in color. Our, okay. our dry rosé tends to be really, really very light. Um, it, the, the way we make our dry rosé is to crush and destem the grapes, which have to be cold when we bring them in. We then let the juice sit on the skins just overnight, generally, and then press them and ferment it as if it were white wine. Uh, 2019 was a challenging growing year. That's the, the year of this wine. Um, bud break, which determines sort of the start of the ripening season, was delayed by two weeks. And if you delay the start of the ripening season by two weeks in a cool climate, you lose two weeks of ripening. You don't get those back later. So the grapes came in fully ripe with really good flavors that I'm hoping you're tasting, but with indescribably high acid, acid that would just sear your mouth. And we're committed to not adding acid, not taking out acid, not adding sugar, not, not making chemical modifications to the wine if at all possible. And so rather than cold soaking just overnight, the grapes for these, this wine was cold soaked for four or five days because that causes the acid to naturally lower. So that's why it's as dark as it was. And I'm sure that's the question you meant to ask is <laughs> why is this rosé so very, very dark? Well, it's good to know. I mean, there's such a variation between rosés in terms of color, but okay, good to know that <laughs> This one is very dark. Now we do have a question from the audience. What is your aspect slash slope variation in height in relation to the lake for Sheldrake oh, or Dave? That's a really good question. And I was sort of vaguely hoping it was on that map. I believe that the bottom of the vineyards are relatively close to sea level and that the top of the vineyards, the number that sticks in my head are 453 feet. Is it on that map? Can you pull that back up? And can we go back to the other map? Yeah. If, oh, 578 feet. See, this is why they don't let me talk to people. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's you, right one could do the math. It's, a, it's about three quarters of a mile, and the elevation in that three quarters of a mile is 578 feet. So. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so we're going to take, if we can move um, just forward two slides, we're going to move over and we're going to change case slightly and we're going to go south um, down to Long Island and we're going to speak with Christopher Tracy. Hi Christopher, how are you? I'm well, Melissa, how are you? Good. 
So, Chris, well, there's lots to talk about here. I mean, you have a whole separate region than um, the Finger Lakes. Uh, if you could touch a little bit about that um, to start. Specifically, um, if we can move to the next slide, we'll take a look at the two forks. And you're, you're on the South Fork. That's where your winery is located. We see a lot of the other wineries are located on the North Fork. Um, what is, and I, I believe you're sourcing fruit from both. So what, how would you say they differ first of all, and then we'll talk a little bit about varieties too, because I know you're making quite a few different varieties. Um, sure. All right. Well, that's a lot to unpack, but let me start. Um, all right. So Long Island, um, we, like the Finger Lakes, are a region defined by water, as you can see, in a very different way than the Finger Lakes, but there is water everywhere around us. Um, we're on the South Fork, and so just a couple miles from the winery is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then we have uh, the Great Peconic Bays in between the two forks and the Long Island Sound, and that moderates our climate. So it makes our winters more mild and our summers um, a little bit cooler. Um, we're a moderate wine growing region that practices cool climate viticulture, namely our grapes ripen really in the fall, but we have more heat than you think, which is also why red varieties and so many different varieties do so well here. Um, South Fork versus North Fork. There's more similarities than there are differences. Um, the South Fork has, as you can see, more actually plantable land and land than the North Fork, but much of it was bought up, especially by the time the modern commercial industry started in the mid 70s with the Hargraves and the Muds um, in 74 and 75, um, planting you know, new commercial vineyards, the first ones on Long Island with the industry that we're talking about today. By that point, even the South Fork was starting to be more developed and you know it's taken until just recently for that to happen on the North Fork. So more agricultural land and more wineries were preserved and started on the North Fork as opposed to the South Fork. Um, so it's really just three commercial wineries on the South Fork, Wolfer Estate, Us, and Duck Walk, which is part of Pindar on the North Fork too. But like I said, there's just as much difference between the furthest west vineyards in Riverhead and Aquabog and Orient Point and Greenport as there is between Bridgehampton and Kutchog. Um, so there's more similarities than differences. Um, of course there's differences, there's differences between vineyard to vineyard, between you know, elevation of you know, 100 feet to 500 feet. Um, but we, we, we share much of the same, uh, much of the same issues. Um, certainly we're a little bit cooler, maybe one or two degrees with a little bit more Atlantic influence um, than the North Fork because we're right on the ocean. Um, soil are all loam based soils. So we're uh, basically there's three main soil series out here. There's all loam based, very well drained soils, which is one of the reasons it allows for high quality viticulture because they're so well drained in a region that gets lots of rain during the growing season. Um, so Bridgehampton loam, and you can see that behind us, that's a picture of me, uh, behind me, the virtual background is a picture of soils from our vineyard. Um, so that's Bridgehampton loam, there's Riverhead loam, and there's Haven series loam as well. Um, so gravelly subsoils, there's some clay bands that go through some things like, and you can even see some in there and, and go through a brick kiln vineyard of ours too. Um, hence the name brick kiln, which is next to Clay Pot Road where they used to get bricks from the clay and make them a long time ago. Um, but there's a start. I know there's so much to talk about. Now you're, from what I read, you're really into sort of small batch. You're pressing your grapes with your feet. Um, you're, you're blending, you're using multiple varietals. Um, we also recommended um, in terms of, actually let's go back to the wine itself for a moment. Um, so this particular wine, you've used four different grape varieties. Yes, uh, Merlot, Cab Franc, Blau Frankish, and Dornfelder in the 2018 Rosa Fresco, which is a fun, fresh, easy, delicious, super versatile blend you can pair with tons and tons of different food, which we can talk about. And yes, we like to push the boundaries of what's possible in our region and our vineyards and our cellar and push diversity, which is New York's greatest strength, I think, and one of Long Island's greatest strengths. We can grow a multitude of different white grape varieties and red grape varieties, making a uh, 
a, a, a rainbow of styles from sparkling through fresh white, through earthy white, through oaky white, through skin fermented white, through light reds and medium bodied reds. You know, we're not a warm dry district, so we don't get bold, heavy, high alcohol reds, but then um, uh, sweet wines. There's a potential for so many different things with so many different varieties. And so, yeah, we do lots of things in small batches. Um, I mean, we have wines that are from 50 cases to about 1200 cases. Our biggest batch, our biggest tank is 3000 gallons. So there you go, 1200 cases about. That's about as big as a thing, as big as something that we'll make, which is like our Scuttlehole Chardonnay or our Rosado Cabernet Franc or our Rosado Merlot, or sometimes even Rosa Fresco. That ranges between six and 1200 cases um, generally. But um, we like to celebrate a lot of those varieties as uh, individual varieties and varietal wines. And we like to blend them as well, like Dornfelder, which is a great blending gra grape in this, a German grape variety um, that we grow that comes, um, and you know, a lot of this comes out of the research that Cornell has done, Alice Wise did um, at the Cornell Research Extension here um, in Riverhead and our connection to that with Larry Perrine who's our founder and CEO and a soil scientist and one of New York's great viticultural gurus. And because of that and the experimentation they've done since the 80s at that vineyard, we built upon that knowledge to push the boundaries with different varieties and different styles. And that's also where the Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing Program came from too, because that was built on the back of Alice Wise and Libby Tarleton's um, work at the research extension with the vine growing um, uh, workbook that directly moved into the Long Island Certified Sustainable Wine Growing Program that we were a part of founding along with Barbara Shin at Shin and Rich Olson Harbick at Bedell and Jim Thompson and Martha Clara that, you know, more than half of our region is part of it now. And so we're super proud of that too. Which is so great. Um... And remember, sustainability is not just about, it's the three E's, right? So it's environment and what we do to our soils and our earth and our groundwater and our air and, and the materials that we choose, but it's also economic so we can have a sustainable business that can make that happen, that can provide then social equity and sustainable wages and health insurance and things for a workforce that can be supported by economics that can take care of the environment and within those three e's overlapping you have sustainability so there is you know definition to that too i think it's so important to tell that story too because i think sustainability for a long time has been used as sort of a, an overarching statement for a lot of different practices from a lot of different countries and I think as we continue to share that message and we continue to help people understand what it means, I think people resonate with that. And I think it's really important for now and, and also for future. We did have a question come through um, with regards to the Rosso Fresco. Um, someone noticed a bit of fizz on the finish. Is that? I don't know, did you shake the bottle up? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, my bottle, my bottle has no fizz. I mean, look, we, we bottle wines youthful. We bottle this wine after five months in barrel. Um, I'm not, you know, sparging these wines or moving them around. I certainly like a little bit of CO2 in there sometimes to have uh, um, freshness, but I don't see any in, in, in my bottle at this point. But, you know, I mean, that's a really hard, who, who knows? <laughs> And one other question. So there's another word that people are using, um, at least within the trade, that we're, we're seeing more and more, and that's around natural wines. So I know your sort of direction is very low intervention. Are you, would you call these wines natural wines? I don't like boxes um, or, or labels. Um, I like to like, you know, keep expanding and pushing out of those sorts of things. I, people can call them whatever they want to call them. I'll tell you exactly how we made them and what I did to them. And, and everybody else can make up their own minds. Yes, we are into minimal in intervention our, our, and, and, and minimal handling if, if that's a possibility and it warrants and basically all our, all our red wines and skin fermented whites and a bunch of others, but all our red wines are hand harvested fruit. Um, they're de-stemmed, but they're uh, no crusher rollers hooked up into little one ton baskets. Like you said, if they need more expression of juice, we'll put on waders and we'll get on there and we'll stomp on them by foot. We punch down by hand and shovel. All these bins are outside in ambient temperatures and nothing is added to them. So they are ambiently fermented with wild, or spontaneous or whatever you want to call that yeast that 
builds its culture in there. After the cap falls and they're dry, we bucket them out and we press them off, let them settle. They go into barrels. We don't move them until we rack them to blend and bottle them. Um, I'll add some sulfites. Okay. Well, that's that's kind of the 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 defining feature of natural wine, right? It's uh, it's all about the permittable levels. But thank you so much for that, Christopher. We're going to move on over to Megan. So, Megan, you are the great granddaughter of Dr. Constantine Frank, who is known as sort of the the father of the vinifera grape. Um, your family has some incredible history on Cayuga Lake, so not to be confused with Cayuga Lake, and some of the oldest blocks of Pinot Noir dating back to 1958. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the area, um, specifically the lake you're on? I know that you're also, I believe, sourcing fruit from Seneca Lake, and perhaps you could just walk us through a little bit about the history of your winery, given um, its heritage and involvement in evolving the wine industry. Absolutely, Melissa. Uh, so nice to be with you all tonight. And uh, yeah, so Cayuga Lake, as you mentioned, not to be confused with Cayuga. Uh, you can see, if you come to the Finger Lakes, you see a lot of bumper stickers with QKA. That's the shortened <laughs> name of Cayuga, very cute. Uh, Cayuga actually translates directly uh, from the Iroquois language uh, to canoe landing because it was a great paddling lake. And it is the only finger lake to have a fork shape, um, which is very unique and different. Uh, and our, you know, history with with Cuca and with growing vines, growing grapes, and um, uh, viticulture actually did that all the way to 1829. Not with my family, um, but that's where the first um, plantings uh, were on Cuca Lake, and it was a booming, you know, lake for viticulture for winemaking, and. Um, uh, basically, our story starts with, as you mentioned, Melissa, my great grandfather. Uh, and if everyone has the bottle in front of them, they'll notice he has a doctor prefacing his name. Uh, so he wasn't a medical doctor, but actually earned a PhD in viticulture uh, from the Polytechnic University of Odessa in Ukraine. So that's where he spent the first 52 years of his life um, as a researcher and experimenter, um, managed a large uh, research station there and had many different grape varieties planted, um, you know, throughout, uh, you know, his station there, over 2,000 acres. So really devoted his life to research and sort of everything came crashing down in World War II. Um, the family was lucky enough to flee out of Odessa, out of Ukraine uh, to America. And they, they came through New York City and then eventually to the Finger Lakes and Constantine you know, didn't speak a word of English. He spoke nine languages and uh, at the age of 52 had to basically start completely over um, with his three children and his wife. And um, basically he was really intrigued with the Finger Lakes. You know, he was uh, excited about the Chardonnay, the Riesling and the Pinot Noir particularly planting uh, those varieties there. And researchers in the region told him it was too cold, that vinifera would not survive. And he thought, absolutely not. Uh, in Ukraine, it would get so much colder than it does in the Finger Lakes. And so he knew it had to be something else. And he narrowed it down to a theory that it was due to phylloxera. And that was the reason why vinifera was not, was not successfully being grown. So what he set out to do was plant on American rootstock, um, which is naturally phylloxera resistant. And this was a widely you know, practiced technique in Europe, um, where he was also in Eastern Europe. And so he brought that to the region, uh, to the Eastern United States, and started with Pinot Noir, with Chardonnay, with Riesling, and expanded to 66 different grape varieties, all vinifera. So um, we have a few of those on the property, but we've streamlined somewhat. <laughs> um, but that's basically our story. You know, we have um, plantings on Cuca Lake, but also additional <laughs> acreage on Seneca Lake. Um, not too far from John and Bruce over on the east side of Seneca. And um, we love the, the two different sites, the west side of Cuca, little higher elevation, steeper slopes, shale-based soils, um, whereas Seneca, east side of Seneca, much warmer, loamy, uh, well-draining soils. So it's nice to, have, nice to have both. Can we talk a little bit about the Pinot that we have, um, that we're tasting? Um, so historically, you're producing very classic.
classic style pinot. Um, this seems to have a bit of your modern fingerprint on it. Megan, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing sort of in the winery and perhaps how much barrel age this is seeing and sort of what your direction is stylistically? Sure. Yeah, so I think the, the, the fun thing about this Pinot is, um, you know, it's coming from our two different sites and we have a really interesting diversity of clones here. Um, so we, we have uh, eight different uh, clones on the property. Uh, the majority being seven and 13, which are pretty common in the Finger Lakes. But we also have fun ones like uh, the Maria Feld clone, which is a Swiss clone, which has looser, a looser bunch. Um, so we have, you know, a really interesting diversity there. Um, and then in terms of the winemaking style, you know, you can tell it has a really nice, bright, um, you know, medium hue. Uh, oftentimes when we hear, you know, consumers complain, oh, you know, your Pinot is so light. They're like, well, <laughs> it, it, you know, has very thin skin. Uh, so it's not, you know, totally natural usually when you have a very dark um, colored Pinot. Unfortunately, we still live in <laughs> uh, being produced in America. But um, yeah, so basically a really nice light hue. Um, the magic with the oak is going to be a very light touch. Uh, so we're looking at no new oak, uh, all two to four year old oak barrels, uh, all French oak. Um, so we do uh, fermentation. We do usually a few hours of cold soak between six to 12 hours uh, of a cold soak before going into uh, red fermenter, um, where they, um, the wines are fermented punched times a day by hand, uh, and then pressed off, and they go straight into our oak barrels for 18 months. Um, so I, I mentioned a light touch of oak. So we think of oak like garlic. You know, we, we like a touch of it <laughs> just to bring out all of the flavors, um, but not too much to, to overwhelm or overpower, especially with such a delicate expression. Of Pinot Noir, I think it's really important um, to not overpower the fruit and the, the elegance and um, the delicate aromatics there. I think we're seeing a bit of a theme too in terms of this sort of cooler climate region and using less and less oak um, as styles evolve, etc. So it's nice to see. So thank you for sharing that. It's delicious. Thank you. And we'll move um, Last but not least, over to Bruce Murray, um, who's going to walk us through boundary breaks. So you identify actually on your, your website as Riesling being your first love. However, we are going to be tasting Cabernet Franc today. So I just wanted to maybe touch a little bit on uh, Riesling uh, with you, Bruce, uh, just given the fact that it's so widely planted in the area. Um, and then perhaps we can talk a little bit about where you're located um, as well as uh, maybe bring Dave back in to talk a little bit about the Cabernet Franc. Sure, uh, thanks Melissa and thanks folks for um, hanging in this long. Um, so I am really um, the newcomer here. I uh, has started this vineyard in 2008. So I was the beneficiary of a lot of the pioneering work that was done by by Megan's family, by John's family, by uh, Julia's employer, Cameron Hosmer. These guys and gals had 40 years of, of really figuring things out. And when I came here, I knew that uh, at least it had been become clear that Riesling was um, a, a fairly reliable grape to plant. I had also once about five years earlier in the early 2000s, been at a Thai restaurant in Las Vegas, not knowing all that much about wine, knowing nothing about pairing food and wine. And I had a, a Riesling with a Thai meal that was just spectacular and unforgettable. And so after spending the majority of my professional life in two different careers, the second one, having come to a nice close, I said, I have one more career in front of me. So I came to the Finger Lakes, I, it's about an hour from where I was raised. And I decided, let's see if we can make Riesling um, um, go here. Well, I soon learned that as good as Riesling is, there are people who like red wine also. So we began, uh, when we saw that our site, as John has said, as, as Megan has said, being on, uh, on Seneca Lake because it's 
as deep as it is, being close to the water in the background, my virtual background here has uh, the lake um, uh, over my shoulder. Our vineyards are very, very close here and we benefit, as John said, from the, the moderating influence there. We found that we could get our Riesling really, really ripe up on this site. And so we tried to see by a, with a test, small test planting of, of the Bordeaux reds, um, whether uh, we could get our red grapes equally ripe. And in fact, we could. Um, I should also add that we are primarily viticulturists and we work with really fine winemakers from around the region. And in the case of this wine you have in front of you, that's a, a 2018 uh, Cabernet Franc is 100%. Cabernet Franc 2018 was probably a, um, a year that, that was as challenging as they come. Um, but as uh, it was very wet, it was not very warm, and we were all fighting uh, in the fall to keep our grapes healthy and, and, um, and intact on the vine. So this 18 Cab Franc is, I think, a, a really, really fine expression of what Cab Franc is from the Finger Lakes. And yes, it is a cool climate wine. It's got great fruit. Um, it's a, a uh, I think a, a great varietal expression of, of, of uh, this, this variety. As I said, Dave Breeden from Sheldrake, who you've heard from already, who is a non-interventionist winemaker, which we really respect and we really admire, um, has been making our reds since the first year that uh, we, we um, uh, uh, harvested them in 15. You know, I, I, I'd ask Dave what he thinks about um, when he, we bring him that fruit and, and what his perspective is on it. Uh, the, I mean, I, I work with Cabernet Franc from a variety of growers. I work with other red grapes from a variety of growers, not for Sheldrake. <clears throat> Sheldrake is 100% estate, but for some of our other clients. And the, the red fruit from Boundary Breaks is distinctive. They are the smallest berries I've ever seen. They're, they're very, very tiny, on the order of a gram a piece, where a normal berry size for Cab Franc would be 1.3 or 1.4 grams, 30 to 40% bigger. So that means you have a lot more skin compared to juice, and you can do a much greater extraction. And even in a year like 18, which Bruce wasn't getting, it was a tough year, get a really nice big red wine. But big in a Finger Lake sense, not in a Napa sense. Um, Boundary Breaks Vineyard Site for Reds is, is sort of the best of all worlds because they get full ripeness, but they don't have the California problem, which is the problem of having really high levels of sugar before you get physiological ripeness. The, the berries that come out of Boundary Breaks Vineyard are, are balanced, they're in harmony. You have good physiological ripeness with reasonable levels of sugar and reasonable levels of acid. And that's what it takes to make a really good wine. So it's easy to do. You know, one of the things I'll add um, is that Cornell, which is the agricultural university for New York State, also has a very, very um, capable uh, viticultural program, did some work to show that certain viticultural practices lead to uh, a more satisfying uh, out outcome when it comes to Cab Franc. The wrap on Cab Franc, which some people find herbaceous or a little bit um, green pepperish, it turns out that uh, as Cornell had shown that techniques in the vineyard like removing leaves in the around each cluster very, very early in the season, that is just as soon as you're seeing small berry formation by removing leaves and giving those small berries and clusters direct sunlight, maximum direct sunlight, that can suppress the production of that chemical in the fruit that causes that herbaceousness that some people uh, don't enjoy that much. Additionally, doing uh, cluster thinning, that is reducing the, the crop load right before the grapes begin to ripen allows A, the berries to develop fully. And in our case, they don't, the berries don't get too large. But then when you take 15 to 20% of the fruit off the vine, then that remaining fruit is able to get 
the full benefit of the entire ripening capacity of the vine. So all these are viticultural practices, which, you know, they, they're time consuming, but we think they show up in the wine itself, especially when someone like Dave is at, at the controls in the winemaking process. Melissa? That's great. Well, I think, I mean, it's, it's tough within an hour to really dive deep into everything that everyone is doing. I think um, we're so lucky to have a panel of uh, winemakers um, and winery owners who are really at the top of their game. And I think we just really scratched the surface and I'm sure we'll have people looking to do more of these. So just wanted to first and foremost, say thank you to you all for, for joining us tonight and for taking the time out of your schedules to share your stories and uh, taste through the wines. Uh, we've been answering the questions as we go, as I sort of um, wrap up in closing and just uh, say a few words, thank yous. If there's any other questions, please include them in the Q&A. Otherwise, we can definitely forward them directly to the winery so they can answer them for you. Um, so again, thank you so much uh, to the winemakers for taking the time. Uh, we'd love to also thank the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for coordinating the event um, on behalf of the wineries and ourselves. Uh, we'd like to thank Taste of New York for sponsoring the event and making it possible. Um, we'd also like to thank Heather and Sips Toronto for her executions, getting everyone their wine packs and their sample bottles. Um, and we'd love to also thank the LCBO for partnering with us on this um, and partnering with us in the future to really share the story of the New York State wine region and everything that's happening there. I think, like I said, we're only scratching the surface and I think there's so much more to come. Uh, the LCBO website where you can purchase these wines online has been included in the chat as well as the SIPS Toronto website if you're interested in coordinating your own uh, virtual tasting similar to this. And last but all, not least, I would like to thank you all who joined us online tonight. I know that um, with COVID, uh, they're not, there's not necessarily a lot of events that you're leaving your house for, but I think your time is very limited on what you wanna spend it online. And we really thank you for joining us tonight and discovering New York State Wines. And we look forward to seeing you at another one of these events again. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you all soon. Cheers and happy holidays. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you.